Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Bricking, and I'm one of the Educational Programming Committee co-chairs for the Society of Ohio Archivists. My co-chair, Bill Modro, and I, as well as the rest of the Educational Programming Committee, would like to welcome you all to our 2020 annual conference, Archiving 100 Years of Change. Although we couldn't meet in person this year, we are so happy that you all could join us virtually over the next two days. We would like to thank our meeting sponsor, Hollinger Metal Edge, for supporting the Society of Ohio Archivists annual conference, as well as Ohio Humanities for their support of our upcoming plenary speaker. Before we get started, we would like to cover some meeting logistics. All attendees are being muted and video is turned off in order to prevent background noise and save bandwidth. The chat box is also turned off for this webinar. So please use the Q&A box to submit questions and comments to the presenter. If you're having technical difficulties, please reach out to me or to Betsy Hedler for assistance. Follow the meeting on Twitter using the hashtag SOAAM20. This session is being recorded and a link will be sent to all SOA attendees after the meeting. Now, I would like to welcome our SOA president, Adam Wanter, who will be introducing our plenary speaker, Kimberly A. Hamlin. Dr. Hamlin will be speaking to us on the topic, Finding Sex, Race, and Suffrage in the Archives, What I Found When I Looked for Helen Hamilton Gardner in the Library of Congress's Manuscript Collections. Hello, and welcome everyone to SOA's first virtual conference. I'd like to thank you all for attending, either now or by watching the recordings later. I'd also like to thank Stephanie, Bill, and the rest of the EPC for planning not one, but two conferences this year. SOA is forever, forever thankful for your contributions. Now, it is my pleasure to do, introduce Dr. Kimberly A. Hamlin. Dr. Hamlin is an award-winning historian, speaker, and writer. Her book, Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner, reveals a fascinating story of the fallen woman who reinvented herself and became the most potent factor in the congressional passage of the 19th Amendment. Free Thinker received support from the National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Award and the Carrie Chapman Cat Prize for Research on Women in Politics. Appointed to the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecture Bureau, Dr. Hamlin speaks about the history of women, gender, and sex across the country. A regular contributor, contributor to the Washington Post, Dr. Hamlin's research has also been featured in NPR and CBC Radio, Vice, QZ.com, uh, numerous other outlets, and she has contributed to several PBS documentaries. Dr. Hamlin is currently helping to organize uh, commemorations on the 2020 suffrage centennial, and she serves as a historical consultant to the Bearded Lady Project, now on view at the National Museum of Natural History. Dr. Hamlin lives in Cincinnati, where she co-hosts the Mercantile Library's Women You Should Know book series and teaches at Miami University in Oxford. Thank you so much, Adam, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Stephanie, for organizing today's event. Thanks to you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here today. This is one of the most uh, well-planned events I have thus participated in. So I wanna thank everyone at SOA for all of their hard work in putting, um, as Adam said, together two conferences, the actual one and now the uh, virtual one. I also wanna thank the Ohio Humanities Council for supporting this and also for supporting me as one of their, um, as one of their speakers on their Speakers Bureau and the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting this research. Um, before I get going, Stephanie, can you nod? Can everyone hear me okay? Is everything working? Okay, awesome, thank you. It would be a shame to give this whole talk and have no one <laughs> realize my audio is off. Um, so thanks so much. I'm gonna now call up my um, slides and share my screen, so just give me a second. Okay. 
Okay. So um, <clears throat> one question people often ask, and I'm just going to start with this um, to get, in case you all are wondering this, is what is the cover? Is this Helen Hamilton Gardner on the cover? And I thought you all, um, and especially any Ohio humanities people online today, might be interested to know that the cover was inspired by the Ohio suffragist group. This is some of their own beautiful artwork. So it's not actually a picture of Helen Hamilton Gardner, who is there on the right, but it's a picture of the Ohio Suffrage Association um, that they used often in their postcards, and their mailers, and their letterhead. And it's just so beautiful that I was really excited to have it on my cover. So that's one thing I wanted to share before we get going. And while today's talk is going to focus on the research I did for this book, especially at the Library of Congress, I thought first I should tell you just a little bit about Helen Hamilton Gardner so that maybe you care a little bit more about why I wanted to research her, what I found, and what paths I took. So um, Helen Hamilton Gardner was a fallen woman, meaning she had sex outside of marriage. She had sex, she had an affair with a married man when she was in her early 20s working as a teacher in Sandusky, Ohio. We're going to learn about this a little bit more today, so let's all I'll say for now. But normally in the 1870s when this happened, that would be the end of a young woman's life. You would slink away in shame and that would be it. But Helen Hamilton Gardner was not like other women in the 1870s. She reinvented, she moved to New York City, she changed her name. She became one of the most sought after speakers and writers and reformers of the 19th century. Then in the early 20th century, she reinvented once more. She moved to Washington DC, married a Civil War hero, and became the most potent factor in getting the 19th Amendment through Congress. So she's had a fascinating trajectory and she really pioneered um, a way for women to live autonomously. Her kind of phrase that she used was that she believed women were self-directing, self-respecting human units with brains and bodies that were sacredly their own. Brains and bodies, she said. So she was really ahead of her time and she didn't really just want the vote. She wanted this full autonomy that she herself um, strove to live by, making her own money, charting her own path, when she had few role models to do so. So that's one of the reasons I became so fascinated with her. Now today's talk, I have to tell you, I'm so excited um, to be with you because my favorite place to be is nestled in the archives with a box of papers. And so I really feel like most people these stories are super boring for, but I hope that you all <laughs> actually will be really interested to learn about what I found in these um, cartons of old papers. So I'm really excited to talk with you about the nitty gritty of my research. Um, thank you. And I really am excited for your questions and comments at the end. So today's talk is not going to focus as much on Helen Hamilton Gardner. Of course, we'll learn about her, but I really want to talk about the archival process. So where I went and what I looked for. Helen Hamilton Gardner uh, destroyed most of her personal papers, I think because of the affair and the many scandals she had along the way that she endeavored to keep secret. So she has a small stash of papers at the Schlesinger Library, Radcliffe Institute, Harvard, um, but that's um, a minimal collection. So I started there, but I did most of my work at the Library of Congress in their manuscript division. Um, and I focused specifically on the collections of Woodrow Wilson, his wife, Edith Wilson, Joseph Tumulty, who was Wilson's executive secretary, more like a chief of staff, Adelaide Johnson, who's known as the sculptor of suffrage. She's the woman who made the, um, the collective bust of the three women suffragists that's now in the Capitol Rotunda. And for reasons I'll explain later, she ended up with some HHG, as I call Gardner, uh, materials, and also the papers of the many congressmen that Helen Hamilton Gardner corresponded with, specifically John Sharp Williams of uh, Mississippi. But I also wanna talk today about the politics of archives. What words are in the finding aids? What words are not in the finding aids? And how historians like me who are interested in things like misogyny, sex, race, racism, use the archives and the finding aids to find what we're looking for because obviously words like racism are not always in the finding aids. Um, so the themes we're gonna think about today are sex slash sexism, race slash racism, and memory, but more of, often in the case of women contributing to American life, 
it's forgetting. Why have we forgotten these stories? Whose stories do we remember and whose do we forget? I'm gonna share um, four specific documents that um, I used a lot in my research from the Library of Congress. The first is a letter um, written in code from HHG to her friend, Mary Phillips. The second is the first time that Helen Hamilton Gardner reached out to the Wilson White House by writing his chief of staff. The third is a letter um, from John Sharp Williams to Helen Hamilton Gardner. And the fourth is a Woodrow Wilson's handwritten note about suffrage. I just put these here in case later you wanna to refer to them um, and wonder where I got them and what the dates are. I also wanna say a, a word about what I mean by find. Um, as a historian, I don't mean to say that I have found these in some sort of Indiana Jones way. Um, I know all together from the bottom of my heart that anything historians find is only there because archivists saved it, put it there, archived it, labeled it, named it, put it in the finding aid. So um, I really especially wanna give a shout out to Bruce Kirby, who is the, uh, a librarian and archivist at the Library of Congress Manuscripts Division that really helped me every step of the way. I invited him to join us here today. I'm not sure if he's able to make it, but um, archivists like you all, librarians that I've worked with over the years make this research possible. So I wanted to especially mention that and how much I view our work as collaborative and to thank you and especially Bruce uh, for being such a wonderful uh, partner all these years. So the first um, document I want to talk about is uh, a letter that I, just, that I came across in the Adelaide Johnson collection in the early, early years of my research. And I start with this letter because this is where I knew I was going to write a book about Helen Hamilton Gardner. So I was trying to figure out in the early stages, are there enough documents? Were there enough papers to write this story of Helen Hamilton Gardner? As I mentioned, she destroyed most of her personal papers, so it was a lot of hunting and pecking here and there to piece the story together. And in the Adelaide Johnson um, collection at the Library of Congress, in the collection overview where it lists the correspondence, Helen Hamilton Gardner's name was listed as one of the correspondents. But then if you look at the finding aid, this is just a screenshot of um, the boxes that I looked at, there's no Helen Hamilton Gardner. So you see box 65 and 66, the correspondence of others. This was where I spent days looking through these letters, thinking to myself, why am I doing this? <laughs> this is such a waste of time. I'm not seeing Helen Hamilton Gardner anywhere. Why would she even be in the correspondence of others in this Adelaide Johnson collection? And lo and behold, this. This is a letter written in code to my dear little Phil from little one. Now, Helen Hamilton Gardner was five feet tall and about 100 pounds. And everyone who ever knew her or wrote about her commented on her size, and especially the contrast between her diminutive stature and her big ideas. So I recognize this handwriting up here, you can see at the left, and I said, oh, this makes perfect sense. I think little one is HHG. And now at first, I didn't know who little Phil was. I later pieced it together that it's Mary Phillips, um, her friend from New York City, who's sort of like a fixer for uh, women in trouble <laughs> and her suffrage friends. But if you can see what the handwriting says at the top left, it says, best destroy this letter, underline, underline. Now, obviously this is like catnip to a historian, best destroy this letter, it, written in code, what does it say? Well. In this three page typed letter, which also thank God it's typed. <laughs> um, another reason that I really love HHG is she typed a lot of her correspondence. Um, HHG reveals to her friend, Mary Phillips, the secrets of her life, that she had had this affair when she was in her twenties, that she then lived with this man, his name was Charles Smart for the next 25 years as husband and wife. But when Smart died in 1901, you can see the letters dated 1901, Smart died in January, she discovered through the probate process that the whole entire time Charles Smart had another wife and two kids that he visited um, when Gardner was out of town giving her lectures. So she was shocked and rattled to the core by this revelation. 
And also by 1901, she was one of the most prominent women in America. And she really did not want the secret that she was living essentially with the bigamist to ruin her reputation. So she enlists her friend, little Phil, Mary Phillips, to basically fix it. Helen Hamilton Gardner takes off, as you can see from the letterhead, to San Juan, Puerto Rico, with a new friend who eventually becomes her husband and leaves Mary Phillips in New York City to sort out this tangled probate and keep her lover's wife from making it public. So I thought, holy cow, <laughs> now here is a story. I already knew Helen Hamilton Gardner was a fascinating suffragist and a scientist, writer, reformer, sex reformer. I did not know she was a fallen woman with a secret scandalous personal life. So this was the letter um, that made me think this will, is a book um, that I will be writing. So that's the first document I wanna point out. And also um, how it's interesting that it came up in the correspondence of others, no names anywhere, but this was really the defining moment. Now to tell you a little bit more on this theme of sex and the role of sex in Helen Hamilton Gardner's life, here's a picture of when she was a school teacher. Her, um, her, she was born in Virginia in 1853 to a slave owning Methodist minister. And now her father was very conflicted about, he had inherited the slaves and increasingly could not you know, make sense of owning slaves, especially in the ways in which it conflicted with his Methodist beliefs. So when Gardner was one, she was the youngest of their seven children and her birth name is Alice Chenoweth. So she, her parents, uh, her father's uh, Chenoweth, Reverend Chenoweth, when she was just one, her father moved everyone to DC so that he could emancipate the people he held in bondage. And then a year later, he moved the whole family to Greencastle, Indiana. So that's basically where um, Alice Chenoweth, who becomes Helen Hamilton Gardner, grew up. But the Civil War really destroys her family. Her father and all three of her brothers uh, end up serving the Union. They don't die on the battlefield, but they either um, receive injuries or get typhoid which greatly shortens their lives. So basically, and their family loses their money, they move to Missouri, her mom's widowed by 1864. So Gardner has to fend for herself. She sees her sisters and her sisters-in-law bear and bury children. And ultimately a couple of them die in childbirth themselves. So she thinks, you know what, that is not for me. Traditional marriage, not for me. So she moves to Cincinnati and goes to Cincinnati Normal School to become a teacher, which in the 1870s was the premier teacher training school west of the Alleghenies. Gardner does such a great job that she immediately gets hired um, as a teacher in Sandusky. And within one year, she's the principal of Sandusky's own teacher training school. And she was, took great pride in being the youngest school principal in Ohio history. But as you can see from this picture, she's also very beautiful. So her talents in the classroom, together with her beauty, bring her to the attention of the man I mentioned, Charles Smart. Charles Smart was many years older. He was 36, the same age that her beloved eldest brother, Bernard, who died um, in 1870 as a result of his Civil War uh, injuries. That he's the same age that her beloved oldest brother would have been, and he's the Ohio Commissioner of Common Schools. So Charles Smart's job is to travel around the state of Ohio, checking on all of the burgeoning common schools, making sure they're meeting state standards. But now the people of Sandusky begin to wonder, why is Charles Smart constantly in our town? Sandusky is not the state capital. It's not the biggest. It does, it's, you know, doesn't have the most renowned school district. Why is the commissioner constantly in Sandusky? Soon, rumors begin to circulate that Charles Smart is in Sandusky, not so much to check on the schools, but to visit the beautiful young principal. Now, Alice Chenoweth, as she was then known, has the misfortune to board in the same house that the editor of the Sandusky Daily News, the daily newspaper, other lives in the same boarding house as Gardner and Gardner's good friends with his wife. So they have, she has like a direct chain of information from her daily comings and goings to the editor of the paper. So you can see where this story is going. Soon her affair is in the newspaper. Soon it's in newspapers across the whole state because it's big news that this prominent elected official is having an affair with a school teacher. Some of the papers like this one, the Jackson Standard, I'm sorry, it's blurry, 
even print her name. So now Gardner is not only a fallen woman, but her whole reputation is ruined. She's forced to resign her job and leave Sandusky in shame during the summer of 1876. I also want to say a word here about um, the digitization of local newspapers and what a role this played in uh, helping me piece together Gardner's life. If it were not for the digitization of small town local newspapers, there's no way that it would have been possible to trace Gardner's comings and goings. I was greatly assisted in this effort by some of the librarians at the Cincinnati Public Library who helped me figure out the various databases and helped me learn the various um, best ways to find these local newspapers and digitized forms so I could search by name. This was a huge help in what, what brought this affair and the scandal to light. So this, this affair that Gardner has is what sets her on her life's path. As I mentioned, for most women in the 1870s, this would have been the end of their life. But Gardner was always a critical thinker, always one to ask why, how. So she becomes obsessed with this question of the sexual double standard. Why does she lose her job and reputation while Commissioner Smart carries on? Why are women held to such a different standard when it comes to sex than men are? Why is a woman's virginity considered her most important attribute, Gardner later writes. These are the questions that prompt her over the next several years. So after this of scandal, she kind of goes, um, the, the historical record is unclear about her whereabouts. I think she moves to Detroit where Charles Smart eventually moves and lives with him and begins telling people that she's his wife, even though they are not married. During this time, she reads and reads and reads philosophy, history, science, and she begins thinking about what are the answers to these questions about the sexual double standard. She then reemerges in January of 1884 in New York City as Helen Hamilton Gardner. <clears throat> Excuse me. She takes the names Hamilton and Gardner because they're Charles Smart's grandmother's maiden names. So she links herself to him in this way. This is the picture uh, from her first book called Men, Women, and Gods, which is also the title of her first lecture. When she reemerges as Helen Hamilton Gardner, she does so as a free thought lecturer on, this, on the Lyceum circuit. And her mission in life is to teach women and men that she, the Bible, she believes, and Christianity is the root cause of women's second class status. And also she believes the root cause of the false belief that, women's, uh, that women are to be evaluated primarily according to their sexual status. As she's reading and thinking all those years, she narrows in on the Bible and the stories that the Bible tells about women as, like I said, the root cause. And she also learns about this guy, Robert Ingersoll, who was known as the great agnostic, the most popular speaker on the 19th century, 19th century lecture circuit, bar none. Crowds of 10,000 and more would gather to hear Ingersoll lecture. Gardner began following his career during her exile, and she began to think to herself, if he can draw crowds of 10,000 or more by critiquing the Bible, why can't I? So Gardner came to think that it was her life's calling to critique the Bible from a woman's standpoint. So she wrote down her thoughts, sent them to Ingersoll out of the blue, Ingersoll was a very warm, um, welcoming man who was known to welcome everyone who came to his door. So he wrote her right back and said, this is great. You need to keep going. And also you need to say these things in public. So Ingersoll, in an unprecedented move, agreed to travel to New York City to introduce Gardner's first lecture. And this really put her on the map, having the most famous speaker in America travel to New York City to introduce you, um, you know, guarantees crowds, press coverage that no other speaker could expect. So from this first lecture, Gardner's career is catapulted. She begins a, a, a regional, I wouldn't say national, but a regional lecture tour that national papers cover. Within a few years, she's one of the most prominent speakers and writers in America. This is the book that she writes, her first book, uh, which was an edited collection introduced by Ingersoll of her first three free thought. From there, she expands her scope to talk about sex 
free form. She writes novels, she writes essays. Ultimately, she publishes seven books. And by 1893, she's one of the most famous and most respected women in America. I show you this image because I think everyone knows that the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago was one of the you know, marquee events of the 19th century. Millions and millions of Americans, 40% of the population, traveled to Chicago to view this amazing exhibit. And Gardner delivered more speeches there than any other American woman. That's how famous and respected she was. The New York Sun reported that next to Susan B. Anthony, Helen Hamilton Gardner created the profoundest sensation. So she's really reinvented her, not just reinvented herself, but triumphed in this new world of the, as Helen Hamilton Gardner that she made for herself. Then she has a, a many other trials and tribulations that I won't get into now, um, <clears throat> mostly involving um, her tumultuous personal life. So she reinvents once more. After the death of Charles Smart, she marries, um, <coughs> excuse me, Colonel Selden Allen Day, a revered Civil War hero. He was a Union officer, but he's also revered by Confederates because it was his job to guard the cell of Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And Colonel Selden Allen Day was known to have been very kind to Jefferson Davis. He even brought him a rocking chair so that he could read his books. So this endears him to Confederates as well as Union uh, veterans. And after a, a multi-year amazing trip around the world, the days settle in Washington, D.C. at 1838 Lamont Street. Helen Hamilton Gardner quickly establishes herself as the suffragist's most efficient volunteer in D.C. Nassau is uh, the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Gardner had not previously been involved with the suffragists. She was a little too radical as a free thought leader, as a sex reformer. But by the time she moves to Washington as the wife of this revered, revered Civil War hero, she joins the suffragists. And they love her because she offers a fast track entree to the power of Washington. In the, in the 1910s, most of the men in power are Civil War heroes or their sons and nephews. And Gardner's address book, thanks to her husband, is chock full of these guys, Union and Confederate. So Gardner is their best uh, way to gain entry into the halls of power that have so long eluded them. Not to mention, Gardner's house at 1838 Lamont Street is right next door to, dramatic pause, Representative James Beauchamp Champ Clark who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Gardner's signature move, as we will see, is her personal charm. So she didn't open the door and browbeat her next door neighbor. What she did is she charmed him. She befriended the wife. She had her cook make Southern specialties that she would then share with the Clarks next door. She would stand with her hat and her coat on inside her front door. As you can see, their porches kind of adjoin. And she would listen for Representative Clark's door to shut, indicating that he was on his porch. And then she would go out her door as if by accident and say, oh, good morning, Speaker Clark. Any news on our bill today? So she was very wise, very savvy. And she used these relations, not just with Clark, but also with Colonel Day's many other friends for the cause of suffrage. Her first big coup was to help plan with Alice Paul. That's Alice Paul on the left the 1913 suffrage parade um, that was designed to coincide with the first inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. Gardner worked night and day alongside Alice Paul to make this event a success. She secured all the necessary permits, no small feat, that enabled the women to march down Pennsylvania Avenue. And she also served as the press committee chair, which um, Alice Paul was so impressed with. Gardner used her charm to get suffragists front page positive news coverage across the nation for the very first time. So Gardner did a great job um, uh, in securing the permits and the press, but she also helped convince Alice Paul that African-American women should not be um, welcome to participate in the parade along with white women. Gardner and other DC suffragists told Alice Paul 
that Washington was essentially a Southern city, which it really was in 1912 because, uh, or 1913, because in the 1912 election, Woodrow Wilson, a Democrat, a Southern Democrat, took the White House and Democrats, mostly run by Southern Democrats, took control of both houses of Congress. So DC, not just geographically, but also in terms of the power structures, really was a Southern city in the 1910s. And this is the reality that the suffragists had to grapple with. And I, we will talk more about race at the end and also I hope during questions. So Gardner helps put together this huge parade, <clears throat> but she also becomes lifelong rivals and enemies uh, with Alice Paul. So Gardner's story somewhat gets obscured in this parade because of the rivalry with Alice Paul and because Alice Paul as eventually splinters from NASA as a result of this rivalry and goes to found her own group called the National Women's Party. The National Women's Party papers are the ones that have the most information about the parade and Gardner is sort of uh, obscured in those files as well. Once Alice Paul leaves NASA, Helen Hamilton Gardner sees the void and she seeks to become the suffragist main negotiator in Washington, which she does. NASA calls her their diplomatic corps, not just for her work with members of Congress like her next door neighbor, but also because of the way she works so well with the Wilson White House. That was really her signature diplomatic move. Gardner appears more in Woodrow Wilson's papers than any other woman except for his wives. This is just one small snapshot. You can see all the entries for Gardner from the Woodrow Wilson Papers Index. This is volume two. But I also wanna say a word about how even the story of suffrage in the Woodrow Wilson Papers is somewhat obscured. So uh, if you read you know, the introduction to the index, if you look for the prominent themes that are covered, all of which you know, were written decades, generations ago. Suffrage never rises to the fore as one of the important things that took place during Wilson's tenure. <clears throat> Excuse me. The same thing at the United States Senate History Office. If you look through their files, they have, you know, files for 1918, 1919 of marquee legislation, key things that happened those years. Suffrage, the 19th Amendment, is not mentioned as one of them. So this is about the theme I mentioned of the politics of archives, who writes the finding aids, who writes the descriptions, what strikes them as important. The people that indexed the Wilson papers many, many, many years ago did not think that suffrage was really one of the primary things that happened. So it was surprising to me to see, holy cow, gardeners all over the Wilson papers. I would not have anticipated that. The other place that you find suffrage in the Wilson papers, it's all described or indexed as case file 89. <clears throat> Not all, but most. And case file 89 corresponds to microfilm reel, in case you want to go there and look yourself, 209 and 210. Now I want to show you the second really um, remarkable document. And this is um, to the theme of suffrage. This is the very first letter that Gardner wrote to the Wilson White House. She had been in, she had spent the winter in California of 1915-1916, and when she returns to Washington, she was shocked to find out that her nemesis, Alice Paul, had started heckling the president. She hadn't yet started protesting at the White House, but she had started following the president around, heckling him at his public appearances, interrupting his speeches, and Gardner was horrified. So she sits down at her typewriter, again, thank God for the typewriter, um, and writes this letter to Tumulty, who's Woodrow Wilson's chief of staff. It's a three-page long letter, she introduces herself and she says, you know, hey, Tumulty, it's come to my attention that these women have started heckling the president and I want to let you know that these hecklers are not the real suffragists of America. The real suffragists of America are the National American Woman Suffrage Association. We are not hecklers, she says. We are nonpartisan. We have been working for over 50 years to get the suffrage amendment passed and you should be dealing with us. You, should, you can see she writes personal on there. She includes her calling card, a list of references to all her prominently placed friends in Congress, she says, in case you have never heard of me. And then she does something super smart, which is at the bottom, you can see she writes in hand, is there a day when Mrs. Wilson receives callers? It would give me pleasure as the wife of an army officer to call upon her at the White House. Now the next 
item in this file, file folder is a handwritten note that says, okay, 1015 tomorrow. So by the very next day, HHG is already at the White House having tea with Mrs. Wilson. Now, Edith Wilson did not support the federal amendment, but she loved HHG. They were both daughters of um, impoverished first families of Virginia, and they were both bold, spunky, feisty women. So this helps Gardner get work her way into the White House. Another important uh, ramification of this introductory note is that several days after Gardner sent it, Carrie Chapman Catt and other leaders of NASA requested meeting with President Wilson. And you can see here in his own handwriting, he writes, are these ladies of the Congressional Union variety? The Congressional Union is the Alice Paul Heckler group before it becomes known as the National Women's Party. And this really strikes me because Wilson has already been in office for three years. And this shows he still has no idea who's who in the suffrage movement or that NASA is the national leading voice of the suffragists. He still basically is grouping together all the suffragists as like one annoying uppity entity. So Tumulty uses Gardner's memo to tell them they're not the hecklers. So then you can see Wilson writes in his own hand, okay, Tuesday, 2 p.m. So Gardner's memo not only gets herself into the White House, it gets all of NASA into the White House. Over the next 18 months, Gardner works this over and over. She becomes a welcome daily presence at the White House. She converts Wilson to the cause. She gets to multi to basically do her bidding. She later brags that she, has, she asked President Wilson for 22 favors and he granted 21 immediately and without question. She again and again uses the fact that Wilson hates Alice Paul, and this is the National Women's Party protesters, to work her way into the White House she, by reminding him that she's not like those heckling suffragists. Here's a picture of Gardner and Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of NASA, on one of their many visits at the White House. Now, Gardner also tried to persuade members of Congress to join the suffrage cause. She especially turned her sights on her friend, John Sharp Williams, Democrat of Mississippi. Now you might be saying, why the heck would she try to get a Mississippian um, to support the federal amendment? And it's because for federal amendments to pass Congress, as you know, they need a uh, two thirds vote. So suffragists knew they needed a little bit of Southern support. John Sharp Williams was a close friend of Gardner's because of her husband's civil war service. And he was known as the most erudite of, of senators. So they thought if any Southerner is gonna be turned, maybe we have a chance with this guy. So Gardner immediately, um, when suffrage comes before the Senate for the first time in 1918, she immediately writes um, John Sharp Williams. And now again, I wanna say a word here about the politics of archives and finding aids. So when looking for suffrage in congressional papers, which I did, I found that most members of Congress do not have suffrage as a separate subject heading in their finding aids. You can see John Sharp Williams' papers does. It shows there's a few um, folders in box 43 about the suffrage amendment. So some congressmen do have suffrage, most do not. And even when they do have suffrage in a, as a header in the finding aid, that's usually not where the good stuff is. So what I did instead was make a list of the dates when suffrage was pending before the House and before the Senate. And then I looked in the chronological correspondence folders to see what letters were they getting and receiving in the days leading up to the big votes. And this is really where I found much more interesting stuff. So you can see here in box 33, which covers January, 1918, the suffrage amendment first passed the House in January, early January, 1918, and immediately goes to the Senate. So that's why I looked in January 18, in John Sharp Williams' papers. And this, I found this letter from Helen Hamilton Gardner, January 20th, just 10 days after the House passage. And she says, John Sharp Williams, hey, it was awesome seeing you at my birthday. Say hi to your wife for me, reminding him that they're friends. And then she says, did you analyze the vote in the House and see that Mississippi, the whole state, voted against it? And she says, I want you to redeem that state. I want you to vote for the amendment. She lays it on really thick over three pages and John Sharp Williams writes back the next day. Again, this is not in the suffrage file. This is in the chronological file. And he says, 
you know, HHG, you're my friend. If anything could get me to vote for this amendment, it will be your letter. But he says, I will never vote for the 19th Amendment because it will enfranchise the Black women of Mississippi. Even if this means disfranchising you and my wife and daughters, that's fine, he says, because everyone knows the Black women of Mississippi will go to the polls while the white women will stay home. And then he goes on, and this is the even more shocking part to me. He says, HHG, if you don't know this, I will tell you confidentially, he says, that the real reason the Black men in Mississippi don't vote is not because of the various state laws we've passed to disenfranchise them, poll taxes, literacy tests, et cetera, but because they know that if they do go to the polls, some of them will get hurt. And he says, but because black women are women, even if they are black, this, this strategy of violent intimidation won't work. It would backfire if we tried that on women, he says. So that's why he will never vote for suffrage. So the frankness of this letter, the singularity of it, he didn't make any other public statements on suffrage, but this was really uh, revelatory to me. And it showed me really um, that by the time suffrage came before, the federal amendment came before Congress in 1918, the main objection had nothing to do with women voting. It had everything to do with race. I saw this time and time and time and time again in the floor statements, in congressional testimonies, in letters such as this, that congressmen, not just from the South, but from both parties in all regions, were reluctant or opposed to the 19th Amendment because they didn't want to enfranchise Black women in Southern states where the Black population um, was large, or, and usually, and, and they didn't want the 19th Amendment to somehow compel the federal government to enforce the 15th, which had on paper enfranchised Black men. So fears of the growth of the Black electorate was the number one hindrance to congressional passage of the 19th Amendment. When the 19th Amendment did pass, Congress in June 1919, the main takeaway message is that it didn't pass because anyone thought it would enfranchise Black women of the South. It only passed because everyone knew it would not. White suffragists in NASA and the NWP had convinced enough legislators that they didn't care about the 15th Amendment. They didn't care about enfranchising Black women of the South suffragists essentially said, go ahead and keep disenfranchising Black women in the South the exact same way you've disenfranchised Black men through poll taxes, literacy tests, whatever, state on the state level, just let us have the 19th Amendment. So the 19th Amendment passed Congress only because everyone knew it would not enfranchise Black women in the South. I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, which if you want to click some links and see some more elaboration of this point, you could Google and read that kind of shorter um, version of it. It's also this a big theme of my book. Now, here's another picture of Gardner. This is Gardner at the signing ceremony for the 19th Amendment. Not only she was she the most potent factor in getting the 19th Amendment through Congress, she also planned and orchestrated the signing ceremonies, which I believe to be the very first of their kind, the first time there was a publicized signing ceremony. Gardner even bought the gold pen. So, here she is um, at the, at, I guess it's at the right hand of the um, Speaker of the House, no longer Champ Clark. He, the Republicans took control of the Senate after the 1918 election. And here she is with the Vice President signing on behalf of the Senate. She planned the ceremonies. Here's the gold pen, which she later used to help start uh, the suffrage collection at the Smithsonian. Within days of the Congressional Passage, Gardner sent the pen, a letter, a bunch of other artifacts to the Smithsonian to say, what we need to do is remember the story of women's suffrage. We need to help have an exhibit. We need for women's stories to be part of our national American story. Of course, it didn't really turn out this way, but that was Gardner's next, next mission, to change the way we tell the story of American history. One other point to that in my final document, um, is, this is not quite it, but Gardner was concerned with memory all along, and especially with how suffragists and women's rights activists would be remembered. This letter right here is from Tumulty. Gardner had been pressuring Tumulty to get Wilson to come out publicly in favor of the 19th Amendment for months and months and months and months and months. Wilson was really reluctant to do that. 
but he finally does so on the eve of the first House vote in January 1918. This is the letter from Tumulty saying, hey, now is the time, bring the congressman to the White House, tell him to vote yes, tell him you support it. You can see Wilson writes at the bottom, okay, bring him today. And then the historic thing that happens at this meeting is that Wilson writes in his own hand, this is the historic document, he writes in his own hand that he supports the federal amendment, that the members of Congress and the Women's Suffrage Committee should support the amendment, and then he agrees to let this statement that he wrote himself be released to the press. Multi immediately calls HHG and says, I've got this statement from the president and I saved this handwritten scrap of paper for you so that you can have it because you are the one who brought this about. Gardner writes to Multi back and says, oh my gosh, this is the gift of a lifetime. This will be a historic document. This small scrap of paper written in pencil will go down in history as so monumental because it signals Wilson's support of the vote. Well, do you want to know where this piece of paper lives? <laughs> it never made its way to Gardner. It lives in an obscure folder in the Tumulty collection at the Library of Congress. So Gardner didn't get the piece of paper. This piece of paper didn't make its way into our national narrative about suffrage, about Wilson's presidency. Gardner also wrote to Tumulty and Ray Stenard Baker, Wilson's official biographer, many times to say, please be sure to include suffrage really prominently in the story that you tell of Wilson's presidency. And of course they didn't, not even once. Um, so Gardner again keeps sounding this drumbeat about memory. In her very last speech, given just months before she dies, she brings it up again, and she continued to work toward, towards memory um, within her own writings and work. She didn't get the scrap of paper, but she did get this plum nomination. Months before the 19th Amendment was ratified, Woodrow Wilson appointed Helen Hamilton Gardner to the Civil Service Commission. This made her the highest ranking woman in federal government, just a notch below cabinet secretary, and a national symbol of what it meant for women, at least white women, to finally be full citizens. This was front page coverage across the nation, and it really speaks to the role Gardner played in the 19th Amendment's trajectory and to the close relationship she had forged with Wilson. But again, it did nothing to secure either her memory or the larger memory of women's suffrage or women's important contributions from the beginning to American life, which are still so, so obscured in our textbooks in the shared stories we tell about ourselves. So I wanna end with this slide, which is a picture of Gardner <clears throat> on her beloved Andalusian pony, Caillou, and it's from 1902, and she's standing, oh, well, not standing, sitting, riding, <laughs> in front of the Thomas, General Thomas statue at Thomas Circle in DC. Gardner lived during the great era of civic commemoration. She watched the Lincoln Memorial be passed through Congress. She watched it be built. She watched the nation erect countless statues and memorials to Civil War generals, veterans, Union and Confederate. And she basically is saying here, I think she's posing in the exact same you know, position as the statue. When will we make statues to women? When will we be remembered? When will our stories be told and become part of the national narrative? So that's this, the question I wanna leave you all with today. And I welcome your questions, comments, um, and conversation. Thank you so much for your time today and for this warm and wonderful invitation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, uh, I uh, um, don't see any questions in the question and answer box yet, but um, I actually have a question. Um, I know you mentioned um, that when you were looking through the finding aids, um, that a lot of the times you didn't see suffrage um, as a keyword uh, a, a lot of times. Uh, so can you go into a little more detail about like how you um, did do your um, research then? Yes. Um, should, I, let me, should I stop sharing my screen? Oh, it doesn't matter. You can keep that matter. up if you want. Okay. Or... okay, I'll leave it up because I have a couple other images at the end in case they come up. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm so sorry about my voice. I'm very allergic oh. to everything happening right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, 
Um, this research was so fun. My first book was, you know, a more traditional academic book and in intellectual history. So this book was super fun because it was like part traditional archives and part Magnum PI. Um, so I kind of tracked down all the places where I thought Gardner would have papers in the archives. And as I, so I think your question is about the archival part of it. I also did a whole other part, which we can talk about, but in terms of the archives, um, so I would just try to think of places where she might be and look there. So for example, Woodrow Wilson, um, in the Nassau papers, I saw these references to her work with the White House, a couple of copies, carbon copies of, you know, letters, half the correspondence. So I thought, I'm going to look at the other side of the equation and see what Wilson had to say. And that was really a, just a treasure trove. I was so surprised to see her all over the collection. And then I thought, maybe she wrote to the wife. So I basically then expanded from there to everyone else in the, like the Wilson White House orbit, Edith Wilson to Malti, um, Rudolph Forster was the other um, main secretary at the White House, Ray Stenard Baker, the biographer. And then um, I also just wondered, I said, you know, I knew that she had moved to DC in 1910 and by 1912, the Nassau annual report refers to her as the most efficient volunteer in Washington. So I thought, I wonder if she did anything with the 1913 parade. She's not in any of the 1913 parade histories. It's not as much part of the Nassau collection because of the NWP Alice Paul split. So Alice Paul like took the papers with her and went to the NWP. And because Alice Paul totally hates Helen Hamilton Gardner's guts, which we can talk more about later. And if you want to read more of it, read the Alice Paul oral history interview archives, um, I think at Berkeley, it's, you can really see how much she hates Helen Hamilton Gardner's guts. So she's, uh, she's not really in the NWP finding aid either. But if you look for the 1913 correspondence, then she's everywhere for the parade. Um, she has another, another great bunch of papers um, is at the NYPL, New York Public Library. So Selden Allen Day had a great nephew named Paul Kester, who was also a writer. And so Gardner kind of struck up a chummy relationship with him. She felt that they were kind of kindred spirits. And so she wrote him a bunch of letters that were more personal, really um, beautiful letters. And those are at the New York Public Library Paul Kester collection. So I just you know looked for anything Gardner's name anywhere. And then also date wise, like for the members of Congress, I would look to see like who was Gardner friends with. I made a list of senators she talked about, representatives she was friends with, I knew she socialized with. Also, I found stuff um, in the DC Society pages. It would say like whose wife she co-hosted things with. And then I would look in that guy's files um, and usually chronological because I found that most members of Congress do not have suffrage in their finding aid, especially if they opposed the amendment, they were not likely to put suffrage in their finding aid. Another collection which was really revelatory in terms of suffrage and the role of race was William Bora, the Lion of Idaho. And for those um, Ohio history buffs, William Bora is also the guy who um, fathered Alice Roosevelt Longworth's baby when she was married to Representative Nick Longworth. Um, they had a, a out of wedlock baby that was raised as if it were a Longworth, but really not. Um, so he was Alice Roosevelt Longworth's lover for many years, and he supported suffrage, and the suffragists trotted William Bora out for years to give speeches about how awesome it was that women voted in Idaho. So they were super shocked when he would not support the federal amendment because he had always been a supporter in the past, but turns out he only supported suffrage on a state by state by state basis because William Bora too did not want to enfranchise black women in the South. So he opposed the federal amendment and wrote really frankly about the role of race in his opposition. Um, so that collection really has a lot of important suffrage correspondence too. The Magnum PI part of my research, in case you wanna know, just basically involved um, more traditional biography research where you know, I went to the Chenoweth family reunion, I went to every place Gardner ever lived, um, and I you know, looked at probate records. That was also really revelatory in terms of finding out that she had told her family she married Charles Smart, even though she never did. Um, <clears throat> and also just getting more of a feel for what it meant to be a Chenoweth of Virginia, the kinds of places she lived, what her life was like, how, how important it was in her trajectory that she had the misfortune to board in Sandusky with the brother and sister-in-law of the editor of the newspaper, things like that. Thank you.
Um, we do have a couple other questions that just popped in the Q&A. Um, one, uh, the first one, did you discuss the finding aid omissions that you discovered with the archivists and did they make any updates to the finding aid? Um, no, I mean, sometimes, yes, I would mention it, uh, but I don't know that any have been changed just because it's such a long process to change, I think. Um, and also because I think it would involve a huge amounts of labor. I just, I always would say, here's what I found in case you want to update it, but to my knowledge, they have not been updated. I want to show you one other thing that has not been updated. And also this is kind of about archives, but kind of not. So I didn't talk about this so much today, but Gardner, I first wrote about Gardner in my first book because of her um, forays into brain science. And that was a prominent thing she did in the 1880s. And she thought it was really important that the brains of educated women be studied. So she donated her own brain to science when she died in 1925. And this is Gardner's brain. So speaking of things that are wrong, Gardner's brain um, is on display today at Cornell. Cornell at the time had the biggest, most extensive brain collection. Now there's only, I think, eight left. And just by happenstance, one of them happens to be Gardner's. Um, and it's on display outside the psychology department in Ursus Hall at Cornell. But the big poster behind saying the, uh, you know, whose brains are there has her name spelled wrong. And that one drives me crazy. I've emailed them like, I don't know, 50 times. <laughs> saying, How's it coming? Have you fixed the poster to spell her name right? And still no. So anyway, and then on the <laughs> is um, Gardner's grave. She ended up being, being buried at Arlington National Cemetery on this beautiful, you know, big plot on a hill under a shady tree with her um, husband, Sir Selden Allen Day. And what I really like there is she has both of her names. She has all of her names there. Helen Hamilton Gardner, born Alice Chenoweth Day. <laughs> um, so I think we probably only have question or time for one more question and then do you, um, I, I, we got a couple more in the Q&A. Do you mind if like we send the rest of the questions to you and then maybe yes. you would be able to sure. answer them by, e okay, great, thank of you. Um, yes. Or so, Twitter. Uh, the next, okay, great. Um, the, the next question is, um, did you see any records about Alice's, Alice Paul's reaction to um, Helen Hamilton Gardner's visit to the White House? Well, that's in a Alice Paul's. <clears throat> So no, so the whole time that HHG is insinuating herself, you know, into the White House and becoming a welcome daily visitor, that was all behind the scenes. Same with her work with Congress. Uh, she also, HHG did a significant number of behind the scenes negotiations in Congress, but Alice Paul didn't know about it. So when HHG organizes the signing ceremony, gets her face in the newspapers across America with the pen ceremony. And then when she gets the nomination to Civil Service Commission, Alice Paul is, you know, she sees red. And the reason I know that she didn't write about it at the time, but in the oral history, she brings it up like five times. Like, oh my God, how the heck did this Helen Hamilton Gardner woman make it to the pen ceremony? She's like, I've been out, you know, protesting, being force fed, rain, sleet, snow, dark of night, and HHG gets to go to the pen ceremony. So Alice Paul is really does not know that Gardner has done all these behind the scenes things over the years and is very <clears throat> flummoxed at the fact that Gardner gets the, to organize the pen ceremony and gets the nomination. Oh, actually, um, we probably do have time for one more question. Um, uh, what kind of materials do you wish had been saved? And what would you recommend archivists save moving forward that might be outside the normal things archivists focus on? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I wish that more of Gardner's papers had been saved. So Gardner, in her will, she um, decrees that all of the papers she still held at her house be destroyed. And I, from the description, she's telling her, her favorite niece, who's her executor, you know, she's like, they're in the crates in the closet, they're in these boxes and these drawers. So, <clears throat> excuse me, again, it sounds like there were quite a lot of letters that were destroyed. So that's not anything to do with archival practices, but I wish those had been saved. In terms of archival practices, I, <clears throat> I don't know um, the extent to which there could be like, more reading between the lines of these themes of, you know, sex and race um, or not. I know that you know, there's, you know, 
universally adopted standards for what can count as a key word, what can count as a thing you include on the finding aid. But within the descriptions, I feel like, and but also the, a lot of the archives I'm working with were, you know, archived and indexed generations ago. So I think that if I were doing research on collections more recently, um, you know, indexed, maybe it would be different. But for my time period, um, all of these things like women, <laughs> you know, not mentioned. Um, and especially I found this for my first book when I wrote about how women responded to evolutionary theory. So that I heard, you know, so many times I would say, oh, I'm here to look at, you know, what evolutionary theory had to do with women or sex. And this, I specifically looked at sexual selection theory, which has the word sex in the title. Um, but I would hear it time and time again, oh, we don't have that here. You know, this has nothing, this has nothing to do with sex or women. And I was like, hmm. So I think just um, maybe um, a, a broader dis definition, a broader, more expansive view when it comes to reading between the lines about the role of women um, and, and the role of race slash racism. But again, I don't know that this is a current problem with what archivists are doing. I don't think so. I think archivists are pretty much the, the best people on the planet, um, my favorite people. And I think this is more has to do with um, collections that were archived a long time ago. I sometimes joke okay, that well, brands and archivists are like the maesters in Game of Thrones. Um, you know, democracy's last best hope, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so thank much you. for your talk. It's, it, was, it was great and we really appreciate you uh, um, coming and talking to us today and um yeah we we really appreciate it. i'm sure that if everybody could we would we would all be clapping right now but oh, well i, I don't think you can hear anybody but me yeah thank you so much please do email me any questions or ask me on twitter thank yeah. you so much for having me okay thank you thank, thank you. you very much and um, Bye. thank you <laughs> thank you and uh for everyone else who's attending the rest of the soa conference we'll see you at the next session which will be at 10 30 and the session, the session is uh, um, digitizing community collections and um, check your email, which you received on Monday, which will have the link to the next session. And then also when you get a chance, please fill out the session evaluation form, which you should receive um, when you uh, log out of this session or actually it's in this, um, the chat box. Never mind, it's in the chat box. So um, thank you everybody for um, coming and we will see you at the next session. Thank you.